Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's um, it's kind of uh, kind of exciting actually to to get out of the house and um, uh, drive down the A forty six and um, through a mixture of snow and sunshine and all kinds of pecu peculiar stuff. And I don't think I've actually been in physically been in a conference for um, sort of two years plus. So it's you know, it's really exciting. A sandwich lunch, you know, it's just just amazing. So thank you very much. Uh, I can't think of a better place to um, break this, this long in interval. So I've been invited to talk about um, behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. And oh, I'm going to use the keyboard. No. Hang on, let me uh, see if I can help. Okay. Okay, so, so the keyboard is fine. Yeah, sorry, this must be my okay. Help. So, the content of this talk, I'm going to talk about um, uh, background, um, some general issues about about BPSD. Um, April already gave you a list of common common examples. So I should talk briefly about some of those, and then I should touch on how technology might might interact or might be might be useful in relation to BPSD. So first of all, it's a troublesome term. Um, it's one I'm not really very happy with, but we're sort of stuck. Well, we're a bit stuck with it. Certainly we're a bit stuck with it in, in medical parlance. Um, the term seems to have been around for um, sort of 25 years or so. Um, and I think came out of the International Psychogeriatric Association. But there are alternatives um, that can be used like non-cognitive symptoms of dementia, neuropsychiatric symptoms, challenging behavior or behavior that challenges, purposive behaviors, responsive and reactive behaviors. And I think AF used another term as well, which was something to, to do with, with needs. Um, uh, so there's no, and none of these are quite the same, I think. They sort of largely overlap. They largely describe similar sorts of things, but not everything, they're not, they're not completely synonymous. So it's prob terminology is a problem. And also I'm talking about BPS and dementia here, um, because that's all I know about really. Um, but I'm aware that acting also has a root in intellectual disabilities and a strong relationship with MENCAP. Um, and I know that similar that behaviors are a you know, big issue in intellectual disabilities. Um, and they use similar sorts of terms, but I'm not going to talk about that largely, not out of lack of respect, but out of lack of knowledge and, ex and relevant experience. So forgive me. So why are these things important? Well, <clears throat> first of all, from the word go, behavioral changes have always been recognized in dementia. Um, people love to go back to the original paper by Alzheimer's and say, well, August data had, had, you know, she had a lot of psychiatric symptoms as well. She was in psychiatric hospital, she had delusions, all sorts of things. Um, so they've been around for forever. Um, and indeed, over time, you know, if you look at the historical record going back, you know, sort of 18th, 19th century, um, the, the idea that cognition has some sort of primacy in dementia is relatively recent. It's a sort of mm, late 19th, early 20th century sort of idea. So there's nothing magical about saying, well, cognition, you know, is the big thing in dementia. It's, a it's largely a matter of convention as much as it is of science, in my humble opinion. As re in relation to the kind of clinic, the clinical diagnosis of dementia, on the whole, um, however, we, we focus on cognitive change and, and its assessment, and we and on on the whole, behavioural change is not used very much in diagnostic criteria. Obviously, um, visual hallucinations are a key criteria in dementia with Lewy bodies, and the behavioural variant of frontotemporal dementia obviously has got changes in behaviour you know, at the heart of it. Um, but in terms of diagnosing the average case of Alzheimer's disease, actually. The behaviour is sort of, is a little bit secondary to the other things that you'd invest be looking for in investigating. However, be that as it may, BPS are integral to the syndrome of dementia. They they just uh, you can't ignore them, um, and they may not have such an effect on diagnosis, but they certainly have an effect on outcomes. And in fact, BPS probably have a bigger effect on outcomes than cognition does. So you can kind of live if somebody is just forgetful, maybe irritating, but you can kind of live with that. 
and people tolerate it relatively well. But if they start being up all night, or they start eating the plants, or they start hitting you, um, or they sit in a chair and are incontinent, don't do anything all day, then it's those things that really get on carers' nerves. And they're those things that end up in people being admitted to institutional care. It's not the it's not the memory, it's not whether you can't, you know, you can draw two, two pentagons or or not. It's whether, you know, it's what your behavior is like. So they're really, really important. So what are they? Well, um, one way of dividing them up is into psychological, behavioural and biological symptoms. So psychological ones are things like mood disturbances and psychotic symptoms. Behaviour is stuff like um, apathy, aggression, agitation, shouting. And biological symptoms are disturbances in sleep and appetite. So here's an, another way of looking at it, just a list of what's common, depression, anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, agitation, whatever that might be, I'll come back to that. Apathy, which I've put on twice deliberately, the asterisk, because I just think apathy is just a, um, uh, it's just a fantastic symptom, really. I mean, it's just such an interesting um, entity. Um, so I put it in twice because it's easy to overlook because obviously if somebody sat there apathetic, it's easy to overlook, but actually it's really important. Aggression, vocal behavior, sexual disinhibition and sleep problems. Um, and so if somebody's got several of these and you're living with them, um, then it's not easy. And it's not surprising that some carers have a very difficult time. So I've said some of this already really. So the impact, um, so BPS are very common as dementia gets more severe. So most behavioral problems get worse. <clears throat> um, some don't. So if your dementia progresses and you become immobile, then purposeful wandering ceases to be such a problem but you know you, you you may have other other difficulties emerging often very stressful for carers aggression obviously so you know if you're getting hit apathy is much more um stress provoking than people might realize um you think you know the person's just sat there in the chair can't you know quietly not doing anything um that wouldn't get on on anyone's nerves but actually um because there's no sort of obvious neurological reason why the person sat in the chair can't get up and make themselves a cup of tea or can't get up and take themselves to the toilet or can't switch the television on or off or, you know, can't do very, you know, there's no reason why they can't do any of these things, but it's just they don't and they won't. Um, and that, that drives carers nuts. Um, people get very frustrated with that. Um, if anyone's got teenage children or they've got recollection of you know, living with teenagers in the house, uh, it's a bit like that, you know, they could, but they won't. Um, and so BPS are, are frequently a factor in admission, I've said that. And in care settings, they can be quite difficult, as they can be difficult as well. Um, so people being agitated or extremely aggressive, um, and they're often reasons for referrals to mental health services and, and teams like, like ours. So therefore, BPS are really important. They increase the cost and the burden of dementia and they lead to worse outcomes. Um, a couple of very general slides. So the course of BPS is variable, but on the whole, they, they are more marked in moderate to severe, severe dementia than they are in early dementia. Most of them tend to persist, although some might improve with time. Um, and some become less obvious or harder to detect, like, you know, you can't wonder if you're not mobile. So you can measure BPS. How do you, how might you do that? Um, there are a lot of instruments that are available. Um, however, um, and I'll show you a graph in a moment. Um, the NPI, which you may well be familiar with, Cummings et al., um, is predominant. And it um, covers a range that I've listed here of, of symptoms, um, most of which I've, I've mentioned in my earlier list. Um, it can either be rated, it's generally speaking rated by, by carer questionnaire, but there are two versions of it available, which I'll mention. And the carers can also list how distressing they find each behavior. And there's a tendency to add up the scores on each of these items and produce a composite score, which is a slightly odd thing to be doing. Um, but it's a, it's a human tendency that if you've got a list of numbers, you tend to add them up and make a score out of it. Um, it's a bit like adding up the, the fruit in your fruit bowl and, and saying, you know, 
um, it's not very really helpful knowing how many oranges you've got, but you, you end up with, you know, you're, you're adding up loads of things that are different. Ah, now Saul has not only that, it's done something Sorry. clever and technical, oh, but also mess things up for you. Sorry, Tom. There I'm, you go. I'm that gonna... should work again. Cool. So, so this is one of my favourite graphs of all time from a paper that I did with a PhD student in Cambridge, where we were looking at the use of instruments, and it's one of the most, one of the most graphic, um, one of the most dramatic. Um, instances of how a picture can tell a story. So along the bottom, you've got the, the year, you know, the timeline with all the other instruments. And then you've got this other line of, of the NPI kind of coming along like the, you know, the classroom bully really and, and slaughtering the rest. So um, although this, this graph's a few years old, we lo I love it. So I don't apologize for showing it. Um, and this is not very legible, but this is an NPI checklist so you can see that you um well you may be able to see that you can rate the severity and the distress level um of the um the pointer not obviously um okay but anyway you've got two columns for severity and distress and then you can add them up um so I mentioned there are two versions of the MPI um, and the MPI Q. So the original version was an interview with carers, which obviously is a bit labor intensive. So there's now a, a self-complete questionnaire for carers that's that's available, but basically they're the, they're the, they're the same. Um, and as I say, the scores are added up, which means that you could get the same total MPI score through having completely different profiles. So you could be, one person could be quite aggressive, somebody else could be very depressed, they might have the same NPI score and look, look like they're the same, which is either helpful in an helpful or perhaps not very. Okay, so what about, how about management? Well, in general, as with every, anything in, in medicine or in clinical practice, you take a good history, you know, what, what's going on? How long has this been going on? How bad is it? Who's affected by it? Does anything set it off and so on? Does anything help it? Um, particularly important for medics, I think, is the physical assessment. And, and particularly if it's a sudden change in behavior, is it delirium? You know, has the person got an underlying physical Ill, acute physical illness, which is setting this off? Are they in pain or are they, are they depressed? Are also important, really important questions. And once you consider non-prescribing options first, a matter of good practice. Okay, so non-pharmacological interventions um, are of... Sorry, I'm not gonna mess this up for you this time. Okay, just admitting people. Yeah. If that comes up, then I'll... Thank you. Um, Thank you. Okay, so... Non-pharmacological interventions, range of these, so sort of social things, behavior therapy, um, particularly important, I think, is about, if, if the person's a care home, is about working with staff. Um, perhaps the environment may be contributing. If it's particularly noisy, that may be making people in, um, agitated, um, or simply people, you know, maybe are walking around the care home because they want to go for a walk outside. So, you know, why don't you just take the resident for a walk? Um, and often it's a combination of the, these things because nothing nothing works perfectly. Okay, so some some examples of BPS. Um, uh, so depression has a complicated relationship with depression because depression may be the presenting symptom of dementia, but it's also possible that depression itself, particularly if it if it has its first onset relatively late in life, can be a risk factor for dementia. You might have um, both depression and cognitive impairment resulting from same cognitive, um, same common cause like Parkinson's disease, or indeed alcohol can affect both mood and cognition. Um, and depression might also be a reasonable re reaction to having a diagnosis of dementia. So it's always worth considering whether, whether somebody's got depression. Um, and if you start thinking about it, start asking the right kind of questions, it's usually fairly straightforward to um, satisfy yourself, has the person got depression or have they not? Um, though sometimes, uh, particularly in more severe dementia, um, depression may present more less typically, so with behaviour change or feeding problems or something. And there's quite a good scale, the Cornell scale for depression and dementia that's widely used. Saul? 
What have I done now? It's probably the same thing. <clears throat> um, okay, so I've got to it. So also worth considering because it's not quite the same as depression is a state called emotionalism where people are suddenly moved to tears, sometimes to laughing, but usually it's to tears, um, which can be out of nothing. It could be out of a chance remark. They suddenly are in tears um, and then it goes and the rest of the time the mood is, is relatively normal. Um, and um, that's probably also worth treating with antidepressants. But if you think somebody's depressed, it's worth giving them antidepressants. But we have noted, um, and we've done a couple of iterations of Cochrane Review now, um, uh, that the response to depression in dementia treated with antidepressants is not as good as if the person's just got de depression. Um, however, there's also high, quite high rates of spontaneous improvement if people have got depression. So um, all is not lost, even if the antidepressants don't work terribly well, although it may recur. So psychotic symptoms, delusions and hallucinations. So it's not uncommon for people, particularly if they've got um, sensory organ disease like macular degeneration or sensory neural deafness to, to get isolated visual or auditory hallucinations. And they in, the, in themselves um, are not of great pathological significance. They're certainly not they don't respond well to antipsychotic treatments, drugs, but they also shouldn't be treated with them because they're dangerous drugs. Um, so generally, if somebody pitches up with isolated visual hallucinations, but their cognition is generally speaking okay, um, you you give them an explanation. You know, it's just your eyes playing tricks on you. It's not serious. You know, it's not all that serious. Um, we're not too worried about it, um, and you don't need to treat it unless people start acting out on the hallucination. You know, like trying to kill people who aren't in the room or, um, you know, if they've got musical hallucinations and they're sort of trying to break the walls down to kill the neighbours, then you might need to do something. Musical hallucinations are quite a fun subject, um, surprisingly common, but people don't talk about them usually unless you ask them. Visual hallucinations, Louis bodies, I've met, mentioned that. Um, uh, often they're quite well formed, so, you know, people say, start talking to the person sitting next to you, even though you're the only visitor. Um, but also misperceptions of one sort or another um, are quite common. So um, for example, if people haven't drawn the curtains at night and are seeing their own reflection or the reflection of other people in the windows, they may misinterpret those as intruders and throw a brick at the window, or something like that. Or they may misinterpret what they see in a mirror if it's a full length mirror, mirror particularly, um, that can cause a problem. So you sometimes go to the house of somebody with dementia and you, you see all the mirrors have got cloths hanging over them. Um, and also people may, may fail to, to identify people that they know or indeed identify them be as being something else. Um, and that's, I think, a fascinating symptom because um, uh, the responses of carers to it are so variable. So some some people take it with a certain amount of amusement, you know, well, my wife thinks that I'm, you know, I'm somebody else, um, you know, and it's quite amusing. And then I go out of the room and I come back and, you know, she recognizes me again. Um, and then for other people, uh, so fairly sort of trivial reaction, really, for other people, it's actually absolutely destroying, soul destroying. Um, and it's the thing that, you know, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, <laughs> The person with dementia ends up in institutional care, and they really can't cope with the idea that, oh, you know, as well as everything else, um, they don't even recognize me anymore. Um, so I've never really understood why there's such an extreme range of reaction to it in, in, in carers. Um, it's probably worth investigating, actually. OK, delusions are often about thefts because um, if you've got an impaired memory, you put something down somewhere and maybe if you've not put it in the right place, um, and then you go to look in the usual place, you've forgotten that you put it in the wrong place, so it's not there. You didn't do anything that you can remember, um, so somebody must have nicked it. This happens to be now. Um, uh, I get really, really paranoid when stuff moves. Now. Um, I have to be very careful about how I talk to my wife about this. Um, but um, they seem to be a response these kind of theft things seem to be a response to cognitive gaps. And sometimes we'll say, people will say, well, there must have, there's been an intruder. Um, 
you know, how come, you know, the doors are locked, the windows are shut, you know, but yeah, but this has gone missing. Um, they're not as, delusions are not as bizarre, you know, they don't involve extraterrestrials or, you know, the mafia or KGB as much as they might do in, 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 in earlier onset psychosis like schizophrenia. So apathy, as I say, I quite like apathy. Um, so it's a complicated thing. It's got, it's not a single phenomenon, you know, is it, is apathy a disorder of cognition? Is it a disorder of mood? Is it a disorder of behavior? Well, it's got components of all of these things. And so a bit depending on what people are most interested in, it's acquired various definitions because they put slightly different emphasis on whether it's cognitive or emotional behavior. But basically, um, it's something like a disorder of motion, motivation, emotionality, um, and a problem with drive and initiating activity. And it's, it happens to be associated with faster decline. Apathy is not unique to dementia by any stretch of the imagination. It happens in many neurological disorders, but it's also a common symptom in depression. Again, not everybody with depression has apathy because some of them are agitated. Um, so you can have depression without apathy and you can have apathy without depression. So apathy and depression are not the same thing. <clears throat> it's common. So population studies of um, depression, uh, of BPS in dementia, um, identify it typically between about 30 and 50% of people as, as having apathy. It persists, so 12 months later, at least two thirds of them um, still have apathy. It's serious because the rate of cognitive decline in people without apathy is more rapid. Um, this may reflect a more aggressive neurological illness, or it may reflect that actually having apathy is a bad thing because it, it increases your social isolation and your risk of getting uh, kind of physical comorbidity through immobility. Um, so people are admitted to long-term care earlier, they die at about three times the risk of dying in a given period, people without apathy, and it's stressful for carers, I mentioned that, and it can be difficult to treat. So there's some limited evidence for drug treatments, methylphenidate, which is a stimulant, may have some benefit, um, and some evidence around non-pharmacological interventions, but actually it's quite difficult to quantify the effects, but nonetheless worth, worth going with. So we like a challenge, and um, we thought we would um, uh, we'd do a study re, um, a little while ago about the, the subjective experience of apathy. What's it like to be in the head of somebody who's got apathy? And of course, this is not an easy subject to study because you, know, you go out there and recruit people and they're too apathetic, they're not going to tell you anything. Um, so we approached it by simply recruiting um, six couples um, through memory cafes and so forth, who did not particularly have apathy. They were actually quite active people in the scheme of things. Um, though when we ran the, ran the apathy, the standard apathy scale on them, they scored in the moderate range. So they did have apathy, um, but at least they were able to talk about it and their carers were able to talk about it. And we were able, to, we had two interviews, so we were able to interview the people with dementia and the carers separately at the same time, which is quite a good thing to do because obviously carers tend to talk over people with, with, with dementia and that would lose us exactly what we were trying to investigate. So we identified themes for um, our two data sets, people with dementia on the one hand, carers on the other, um, to give us an idea of what apathy, you know, what having apathy looks like. Um, and the themes included things like loss, burden, the caregiver role, but also what's quite interesting was that for both the people with dementia and the carers, there was a positive theme, which was about what keeps me going and about how I get a life of my, my, my own. And we had, I'm quite proud of this, we had no money. We had a, um, an academic clinical fellow who was initially with us for four months, but we had him for double the time because of COVID. Um, uh, so no, no money, um, and we managed to get three papers out of this. Um, so it can be done, you know, grant, big grants are not everything. And we developed a model, which I'm not sure how legible it is, but you've got apathy in the middle. You've got kind of more positive aspects up in green related to the what keeps me going theme. And then you've got the other themes and the sub themes around it. Um, so this, I think, um, gave us 
quite a good pic, you know, gives us quite a good picture as to what is going on in people's heads, what their experience is like. Um, and as I say, you know, quite proud of it because it's, it's, it's a sort of paradoxically tricky study to do. Okay, agitation, um, on the other hand, has got very, also has various definitions. Um, and again, it's a, it has two components, I think. One's about the feeling inside of being kind of wound up, you know, like you're about to go into a PhD viva or something like that. Um, and there's a behavioral objective component, which is what everybody else sees. So it's attention plus the activity perhaps. And it may or may not, it's often associated with aggressive behavior, but it might not be. Um, it, there may be other things that people do, um, uh, which I've listed. Um, moving furniture is a fantastic behavior. Um, so many care homes have experience of having a resident, usually a chap, who moves the furniture around. Um, and the key question, if you're ever in a care home where there's somebody moving the furniture around, is what job did he do? And nearly everybody I know who, um, who moves the furniture when they get dementia had a van. So they're all kind of plumbers or roofers or builders or, or, or something like that. Um, my little joke is it's, it should be called Pickford's disease. Okay, so how do you treat these things? Well, um, there are trials that suggest cholinesterase inhibitors like Zenepisol are ineffective. Analgesic treating pain is as good as anything. Antidepressants are often used, um, but again, there's a recent trial showing no evidence for metazapine, um, and other drugs seem to be pretty useless. So um, antipsychotic drugs are quite often used, although they have serious side effects, and um, there's concerns about that and all drugs have have serious side effects so it's tricky um sleep problems are also common um insomnia is common um but also a disruption of sleep pattern generally people can be sleepy during the day there's a fit there's a um a syndrome called REM sleep dis disorder rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder which is a characteristic feature of dementia with Lewy bodies although not restricted to it um, which is where instead of, so when you're dreaming normally, your limbs turn off, so you remain still, so you're dreaming about all kinds of things. If you've got REM sleep behaviour disorder, your limbs don't turn off, so you flail around, you kick your partner, you may act out on your, your dreams, so people have ended up being sort of strangled, you know, woke, woke, woken up to find the partner trying to strangle them. It does respond quite well to clonazepam. You may wonder what this bottle is doing and if any of you've got Polish heritage you might even recognize what this bottle is but it's a liqueur a honey liqueur called Old Krupnik um, and it was a present from the wife of somebody with REM sleep dis behavior disorder whom I prescribed clonazepam for so she was grateful. Okay so last bit of the talk I'm going to talk about technology and what I'm trying to show here is that technology is is relative and context, highly contextualized and it varies from one epoch to another as to what we mean. So we usually, when you think, somebody says technology now, you think immediately about you know, sort of IT. Um, but actually at different historical times, it's been different things and, you know, tap, running tap water or mains electricity, you know, are in fact technologies. Um, uh, so we shouldn't forget that, the telephone, um, it's been a pretty useful technology for quite a long time. Um, so what about dementia? What's specific about de dementia and technology? Um, so on the one, on the first point here is that there's a continuum between what's good design and technology for older people in general, um, and what's good technology for people with dementia. And indeed, what's good technology for all of us? You know, what's good about you know what's good about design? Um, should people with dementia be expected to use things that um, that aren't aren't available for other people? Or you know, how how can we adapt mainstream stuff for people with dementia? Second point is not everybody with dementia is the same. Um, the third is kind of obvious, really, which is that dementia is a whole spectrum of things from mild cognitive impairment to severe dementia so obviously people's needs and their abilities are, are different at different stages of dementia and 
Final point on this slide, not everybody is the same age. So some people are diagnosed with dementia under the age of 65, indeed in their 30s or 40s sometimes, rarely, fortunately. Um, but different, there, are, there are different, so people with dementia have been born in di at different times in history. And therefore these different birth cohorts, if you like, um, will have different experiences of technology as they move through life, particularly I guess through work, which is where we, you know, education and work is where we've had most exposure to technology. So somebody who's 90 will not have had the same exposure at work to computers and so on as somebody at the age of 60. So they may never have got familiar with using email or, um, or TikTok or you know, whatever. So how does dementia interfere with daily life? Um, again, I've just listed a few things here, but all of these um, impairments like memory impairment, language impairment, thinking um, are potentially amenable to being supported and assisted by technology. Of course, at the bottom we've got BPSD, um, which um, as I've argued, um, can interfere seriously with, with daily life. What might technology help with in dementia? So this is just a slightly random list. It may not cover everything, but to give you an idea, encouraging day daytime activity, maintaining hobbies or interests, keeping people in touch with each other, personal care, safety, and, and lots of other things. And then there are various ways of classifying technology that's available. Um, uh, an oldish classification was about the sort of generation of, of telecare, um, which, which went from the sort of simple things like alarms to um, more recent things like smartphones and apps. I'm not sure that's such a helpful classification. One I quite like, which we, we nicked from the group in Newcastle uh, and have used quite a bit, is um, uh, technology that people with dementia actually use themselves. Um, like sat navs or mobile phones, you usually that would be within in mild dementia probably. Um, that's you things that are used with them, like electronic calendars or reminiscent aids of one sort or another, um, which you might say sort of maps approximately onto moderate dementia, and then technology that's used for people or inflicted upon them, um, like sensors, alarms, and hoist, which is more more starts to make you think more about care home environments and severe dementia. You can also split technology as to whether technology is designed with people with cognitive impairment in mind, um, or whether they're everyday technologies that might lend themselves well to people with particular cognitive dif difficulties. Or another way of splitting it is to think about applications where the technology is the thing, um, so you're looking at an iPad and how you might use that, you're looking at a robot, how you might use that. Um, or else there's a, there's a huge sort of bottom part of the iceberg um, component to technology, which is where the technology is in fact invisible, um, but supporting stuff. So care, care records are an example of, of this, but there are other things where the technology doesn't come near to the person. Um, it's, it's part of, it's the platform that supports it. So there are lots of opportunities and challenges, of course. So there's a growing experience of technology and particularly IT among society at large. The evidence suggests that people with dementia are often positive about using technology. Technology may improve things like independence, behavior, quality of life, care and stress. Um, but when you introduce technology, you, you need to, you, you don't just sort of turn up with, with some device and say, right, here you are, use that. You need to think about whether the person's actually going to use it, whether it's uh, whether it's user friendly, is it actually going to work for the purpose that you intend it to? So the terms usability and effectiveness seem to be used quite a lot in tech literature. However, there are you know not everything is completely worked out yet. So um, the emphasis on the whole has been on safety and care and reassurance. So you get any number of alarms and you know mats and things to stick on the door, or the fridge, and so on. Um, rather than actually improving people's lifestyle. I think this is the wrong way around. Um, I think you know, the experience of having dementia should be about the things you do in your life and how do we promote people to be more independent, not how do we lock them up and monitor them. The uptake and implementation of things that are available is often slow. Most studies that are out there tend to be small scale. Um, there's a lack of cost effectiveness data with, with the research. 
there's a gap between people developing prototypes and commercial products and on the whole there's been a limited attention to design and aesthetics which i think needs a lot more attention so originally technology used to be sort of dreamed up in labs and people would sort of come out with a device and sort of then give it to people and see whether they used it um, there's a gradual realization that you need a bit more more emphasis on co-design so people with dementia um, and, um, should be more involved in the design of technology um, at the moment people tend to use carers because they're easier um, but they're not there are any proxies for people with dementia themselves. Um, technology development has probably ignored the mixed needs of people with dementia and the, the changing needs as condition develops. Um, there's been this tension between, you know, do you design specifically for dementia or adapt ma mainstream products? Um, and there needs to be, I think, more emphasis on developing solutions as a whole rather than individual products. Um, and undoubtedly clinicians have a lot to learn about technology and how, and how it's used and how this fits part of routine care practice. Okay, so technology for BPSD, I think I'm getting near the end here, um, covers a wide spectrum of things that may be helpful. Technology may help to provide social interaction and stimulation, so that can be useful for example, in apathy, but it might also be valuable for agitation if the, if the agitation is um, arising from the person being bored or unstimulated, then actually engaging in a joint activity using an iPad may be a very useful thing to do. Um, technology may also help maintain personal independence, which may improve self-esteem and quality of life as well. And obviously that is also likely to be reflected in improvements in being BPS, if you're improving your self-esteem, you're likely to improve mood, for example. And obviously programs like, like Acting Out and, and what follows on from it um, have a role to play in contributing to this. So in conclusion, um, BPSD are very common. They're part of dementia, they just won't, you know, they won't go away. Um, you need to understand what's going on by taking a history and making an assessment to understand what the needs are and what's being communicated. We need to consider alternatives to prescri prescribing wherever possible. And technology is a huge field, which at the moment probably aim, um, makes place more emphasis on cognitive problems rather than behavioral changes. And that needs to change. You know, we, we've got enough brain training apps. Goodness sake, the next person that introduces a brain training app, I think should go to, I don't know, a, an uninhabited island in the middle of the South Atlantic mm -hmm. or something. You know, really, there are, we are awash with these things. I'm playing meaningless things like um, spider solitaire on an iPad and it sort of interrupts with, a, with, an, with, with a, an advert for a brain training app. And I think, you know, well, I'm doing it, you know, leave me alone. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, any questions? If your first question is what on earth is that, it's a Blake Easton's fish out. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. For the benefit of our, yeah, for the benefit of the online audience, I'll be moving the mic around. Good. Um, any questions? Yes. Thank you, Tom. I'm Hi. Sorry Good I to see you. Hear all of your talk, but I was um, engaged in a in a viva, which was very topical. Um, so it was a student who'd done um, interviewed the care staff in the Republic of Ireland about managing what she calls responsive behaviours of people living with dementia. So, and I've not encountered the term responsive behaviour. It's on my, it's on the one size you missed, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All right, <laughs> that's a shame. Um, but, but I guess, I guess, <laughs> you know, the, the, what's, what's very front and centre in that term is that any of these behaviours are response to either a physical or, or a psychological or a social unmet need of one sort or another. That's certainly how yeah. this particular person is using it. Yeah, the conception has changed enormously so I think when I started off in practice I'm not going to reveal any years here but um, but these sort of behaviors were regarded as kind of neurological mm. you know they, they sort of happen they're a feature of the dementia they just sort of happen um, and therefore you know your response to, so it gives you a rather narrow response of re spectrum of response to basically a medical response um, and I think this has changed enormously 
quite, you know, we all know why, I suppose. Um, and they are seen much more in terms of, of needs and, and so forth, so, yeah. Which is not to say they don't have an anatomical basis. So, um, some of the, you know, um, some of the behaviors, undoubtedly there are changes, but that doesn't help you very much in terms of responding to them. Thank you. There wasn't really a question there, but no, 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 no. But you know, nice, nice thing to talk about. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm just interested in the the aspect that you're talking about with the cohorts that you see people. So we're talking about the aspect. Yeah. Um, is it addressed as that as a behaviour before? Dementia onset, or was it just looked at post dementia? Um, yeah. So, so they, so these were people with, so they're living in the, 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 the participants were living in the community. They got mild dementia. They were, um, so they were able to give informed consent to be interviewed, and they were able to participate quite well in the interviews. So they got mild dementia. They. I suspect they hadn't been apathetic. They they weren't apathetic earlier in their lives. You know, I mean, they were they were kind of busy, normal citizens in in employment. So I think we'd regard the apathy as being a, a feature of the dementia. Um, at what point it it first showed, we don't know because we weren't we weren't inquiring about that. Um, but I suspect it's there very early. Actually, it's just we don't. Um, when people turn up in a memory clinic, we 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 zone, you know, we focus in on the um, on the cognitive testing um, and don't really inquire very much after us the apathy. But I was listening to a presentation last week where somebody was talking about MCI and dementia with Lewy bodies and and you know what, what's different about MCI DLB compared with um, MCI with Alzheimer's pre Alzheimer's disease and. Um, that they were certainly finding that at the MCI stage, that, you know, that, that apathy was there if you looked for it. So I think it probably is quite is quite early. It's just we don't we don't look for it because it's not the thing that brings a person to medical attention in the first place. Any other questions? I had a number of questions. That was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I think it really nicely set the scene. Um, you talked about the MPI having that rise versus, as I understood, the other uh, questionnaires mm. of unmet needs. Why did you think it was? I mean, you like it, Rob, but what was happening there? Um, I, su I suspect it's a combination of two things. One would be some of the, um, the scale has got some virtues. Um, in that it's, it's um, I think that it's quite easy to under, you know, it's quite easy to concept, the, the concept validity of it is good. Um, whereas some of the other studies less so. Um, I think it's relatively easy to measure. It's fairly, you know, it's easy to add it, add it up to say. Um, I think some of the, some of the other bit is, um, uh oh, what do i mean you know almost cultural imperialism that um it, if you're doing a scale it's sort of where you where you developing it matters in terms of selling it to the world so that um you know you're more likely to be successful doing it from america than you might be from kazakhstan or somewhere else like, like, like that so and also if you manage to you know if you've got Good connections with people who are doing clinical trials, and you say, "Well, actually, this is quite a good yeah, clinical trial, isn't it?" Um, and people start using clinical trials, then it starts to become the industry norm, um, and people start to use it. So I think it's a combination of internal and socio-cultural, economico-political factors, really. So it, it's interesting because I, I recognize that at the conferences, it was quite an aggressive drive of the use of the MPI, pretty much any dementia conference you'd go to after the turn of the century, people were talking about it, it was something that should be measured, it was on the recognized. Um, but 
what you're saying is if you look at the other question is that 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 graph was about the use mm. of of the MPI, was it? Yeah. 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 Or, or it's the I think it's the number of mentions of it, but I think that that's oh, the number of mentions. But I think it's to do, I, yeah. that, that's a I yeah. think that's a good reflection yeah. of the use. So why is that over the CIRA or the BEHAVE uh, D? Is there a use of friendliness? Or was it that drive to use the MPI, I, that, that idea that it was? I, I, suspect, I suspect it was a combination of, of, those, of those things. Um, um, I don't know whether it... I don't know whether it had got, also got sort of very strong links with, let's say, the American Neurology Association yeah. or you know, some power base. Um, but, you know, clearly some, you know, some investigators are very, very effective promoters of their work, are they not? You know, good luck, you know, good luck to them in that sense. Um, so I think, I think it's, as I say, I think it's a combination of internal and, and external factors that have contributed to its success, but it is dramatic. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I was speaking to somebody the other day, um, I think it was Smith who, who, who argued it was a really bad scale. Now, I don't know enough about this. I think you have to take the cam. I'm not entirely sure. Do you, do you know anything about the criticisms because it is so widely used? Um, right. Um, I think I'm at the boundary of my, my expertise here. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I guess if I was, I suppose if I was setting up a study, I'd probably just go to the MPI um, because of it, of its, of its wide currency. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't have any feel for the kind of comparative performance of them. Um, we did, we did look a, a bit at that in. Um, Rihanna van der Linde's work, the performance, the performance of different scales. Um, but it's going back a bit. I'd, I'd have to go, go back and read her own papers. The, the distress um, aspect is for the carer to fill in, isn't it? Yeah, it's a carer. It's a, it's a carer instrument. Yeah, so it's either a carer uh, questionnaire or carer interview. Yeah. So I guess one of the criticisms could be that. Lack of person focus. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there aren't many, yeah, I mean, I don't know of anything good that's a sort of um, self-assessment um, instrument. I think one of, one of the items I hope will come up later in the panel discussions, for instance, observations. And I think one of the items you, one of the, the topics you highlighted is that interaction between the carer and the person with dementia, which is, and that's another question I have. Um, you, you, you There's a couple more questions. questions. Okay, yeah, I'm just yeah. hovering over you. We've got plenty of time. Okay, I've right. got right. child breathing down my neck. Right. For those of you who don't I'll see it. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, that's good to know because I was a bit worried about, about, yeah. about, no, about we'll, time. We'll come to yeah. that. We've got yeah. plenty of time because okay. we started a bit earlier. Um, one of the other questions I had was, you talked about positive aspects. Um, that you identified in the interviews. Yeah. Um, could you expand a bit on that? Because your model was really interesting, but I couldn't, it says want to help Bobby. This is from the people with dementia themselves. Um, yeah, we could go back to it. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so so the green, the green stuff. So you've got, um, difficult to point, um, but, um, oh, hang on. Here we go. So you've got th this was so the, this orbit are the four main themes. So this is from the person with dementia interviews, um, and so this one. So these are all about sort of burden, loss, hindrance, obstacles, um, and this one is about what keeps me going. So so what we were we were you know in our semi-structured interview we were saying well what you know, what holds you back and what doesn't go so well. And then we're saying, well, what goes well and what, you know, what, how do you get around this or what, you know, what helps, what makes a difference. Um, and then we've got, so, so from that, there are some sub themes as well. So um, uh, in case people can't read the maximizing involvement, retention of habits, hobbies, and wanting to help, um, which is a, a really, really important aspect actually of people with dementia. 
um, is their wish to contribute. Um, so we think about it all the time about dementia care, you know, what should we keep be doing with, for the person with dementia? But actually, um, one of the things that they really get off on is um, reciprocity. You know, if they're able to do something that is contributing, um, you know, even if it's just wiping the dishes or something like that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a huge need. You know, we all have it. Um, uh, some people more than others, um, but you know we all have it to, to, to some degree. It's wanting to contribute um, and not be not be patronised. So um, yeah, so 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 we were we we saw that as being really very encouraging because um, you know where do we go with a model like this? Well, I think this is um, I think we say well actually you you in approaching somebody with with apathy. Um, these are things that would make a difference. So um, say to the carer, well, look, you know, this person want, wants to, you know, wants to be able to help with something, let's say, you know, so is there a, a task that you could get them doing where they're sort of sharing it? Um, you know, they might put the potatoes under a tap while you peel them or, you know, anything. Um, and, and, and so these are kind of quite practical, whereas if you're just trying to deal with apathy, you know, oh, I'm just doing nothing, um, it, it's kind of global and kind of hopeless and, you know, where do you start? So this, this helps so that you. that came from people with, with dementia? That's here. people with dementia. I think that's wonderful because that opens the door to technology which could facilitate that. Yeah, so yeah, so, so if you wanted, you know, so you, if you wanted to look at ways of bringing technology in, in you, you could use those headings, I think. And uh, this would obviously be very, be very nice for our reputation as well, because you're citing our stuff. But um, but there's nothing like, you know, we were pretty confident this was unique. <laughs> that, that, that's wonderful. I, I like that a lot. Um, do you have other questions? Um, yeah, sure. I'll move on. Okay. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, we have one question from our online audience, if I may, Tom, I'll just yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll see if I can, or maybe I'll just stop sharing temporarily. And we have a question from Ethna. Oh, hello. Ethna, <laughs> would you like to unmute yourself? Do I have to invite you? Oh, sorry, I just muted you by mistake. You'll have to unmute yourself again. Oh. Um, hi, Tom. <laughs> um, I had a question about technology for safety. Um, so examples I'd be familiar with would be things like cameras in the home for monitoring someone, alarms the person if they fall would, that would go off, or things like tracking devices if the person wanders off, which I have found with tracking devices that they don't work so well in rural areas because of coverage issues. But I was wondering about your views on kind of the pros and cons of that technology, because obviously, I guess you want to keep people in the home longer, uh, in their own home longer and give them some independence. But then obviously they have things like ethical issues if you're monitoring someone. And also, is there a false sense of security, you know, that you can leave someone alone if you've got the camera there or it's OK if they wander off because they've got a tracking device or you know your thoughts on issues around them um well you you yeah i mean you you're, you're quite right it's very very pertinent issue i mean i've got a kind of personal view and a respectable view <laughs> um but as it's you know it's a live presentation so um what what you pay for is the personal personal view um so my personal view is as an individual i hate this stuff you know i really hate it i don't even wear a watch you know, let alone carry a mobile phone with me when I go out. I mean, I just, I, I just can't stand it. You know, and the idea that somebody has got my, 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 my data, um, it, it kind of gets on my nerves. I can't drive anywhere without, you know, constant number plate recognition. Um, so, I, I, so I'm personally very, um, not exactly paranoid, um, but it could, you know, it could go that way. <laughs> but, but, you know, I have a very strong personal view about, about liberty. Then I've got, you know, I have to have a more respectable, respectable view than that in order to earn my living as a, as a clinician advising people about what to do. I think the, the sort of issues, the sort of questions that I think are important are, 
you know, is there any is there any possibility for the person to consent to this? Um, or do we have any idea about what their view would have been um, at the stage when they were able to consent? Um, uh, because that's quite important. So, um, so therefore somebody looking after me with dementia might say, well, you know, he was a bit awkward <laughs> about, the, about these things. I don't, think, you know, I don't think he would like it. He would, he would much rather um, his risk, you know, have the risk to go and get, you know, the right to go and get lost. Um, and, you know, if I'm found six weeks later in a melted snow drift, well, you know, so, so be it really, it's quite a good way to go. Um, uh, other people are very, very concerned about, about safety um, and, um, you know, have sort of, you know, they change the batteries in their smoke alarms and that sort of, you know, sort of thing that I don't do very often. Um, so, so where that's the case, so where people are very worried about intrusion into the house and it may, you know, it may be, they would be perfectly happy with it. So consent is, is, is one thing. Um, and um, I, I, I do worry about all the data that's collected and where it all goes and who shares it. So even, even with consent, you don't necessarily know that you're really consenting to, you know, your consent is truly informed because they know what's happening to, happening to the data. And you're quite right, you know, not, not everything works. You know, you, um, you can have all the sensors that you, you know, you can be covered in sensors, you're covered in so many sensors that you fall over. Um, it still, you know, it doesn't stop you, doesn't stop you falling over. It may increase your risk actually. So you may, um, uh, you may in, in fact install things that in, in increase the risk to the person. So suddenly um, you've got some big, red light flashing in a corner of your living room well the person that may not know what it's for so they disconnect it and i don't know electrocute themselves or pull off the wall down or injure themselves um and tracking devices are no you know aren't, aren't then then they're not perfect um so so I, th I think you know ethics consent permission what people you know what people's prior wishes might have been um but that's 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 a personal view, I suppose. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And we have uh, another question, possibly the last question uh, from Chris. Please go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess it's following on from something that Fred said. In thinking about technology in the sort of the broader debate, I guess, and where it fits in this, because at, at times you mentioned the sort of the attempts and studies, the attempts and studies in order to see like which drugs and medications work the best for them. At the sort of middle to low kind of use and, and value. And I kind of wonder whether technology is sort of seen as like the next thing to try and fill that gap and provide solutions. Like, um, it, it, but whether or not that's correct or whether it's being used, but like it's kind of like you suggested, like, is it overlooking other more therapeutic kind of approaches and other kinds of sort of clinical? Like more ordinary things. Yeah, well, I think there's a sort of cultural question in that, isn't there? About um, so, what are we collectively looking at technology to do? You know, to like solve all our problems, and that's not just with dementia. For this purpose, it's with dementia. But actually, there's a sort of um, there's a kind of bit of an ethos about um, uh, looking to, to technology to solve all of all of our problems. Um, although you know it creates some issues as well as as well as solving them um so um I, yeah so i think i think people are hoping for a lot and i think and it's part of the answer to Edna's question just now um is that people may be looking to install technology rather than doing more sensible things or doing more human things um and um, there's this sort of balance between well, what what might be done by technology and what and what might might better be done by 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 humans. And there are um, so, so I think a good example of this actually is the the issue of personal care. Um, so at the moment, if you need personal care at home, you, you know a human being comes to your house and then 
you know, takes you to the toilet and washes your perineum and so on. And um, but the the downside of that is that they're often you know they've only got fifteen minutes. It's a different person from an agency every day, and and you've got no real relationship with them. You know, so basically, a stranger comes in off the street with cold hands and you know does these inti these intimate things and then go, goes away again. You never see them. Um, so it's not fantastic, you know, it's a somewhat criticised system. So it's not inconceivable, you could replace it with a robot. There's nothing, nothing te technically impossible about having a, your own personal, you know, toilet, toilet robot. Indeed, um, in Japan, where there's a, a much more fastidious culture around your personal space and personal hygiene, um, I think they, they sort of do this and it wouldn't be very wouldn't be too difficult to imagine in this country where people say, well, you know, you sort of market this thing and, and say, well, instead of having, you know, somebody off the street who doesn't even talk your language doing this, you could have your own personal robot, you know, only 500 quid. Um, uh, so it could, it could happen here, but then, and some people would prefer it because actually they don't really like the interpersonal stuff or, um, you're dependent on the time the person actually arrives at your house. Um, so my mother could never could quite get used to the idea of having personal care at home because she felt she had to get up in order to let them in. Um, defeats the object. Um, uh, so, so for some people, the robot cleaning would be great. And for other people, it would be the human being, no matter, no matter who it is. So. Um, and certainly in, 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 with all the kind of alarms, you could be in a palace surrounded by a zillion alarms watched by people from, you know, either on screens or in various call centers and so forth and not see a person for months. Um, and it was just horrible, this topic. Um, so I think, yeah, I, th I think the, I, th I think the kind of human side of the technology in relation to dementia is way more interesting than all the devices. I mean, the devices are just devices, you know. Some, some people love making them and so on, but they're just devices and a means to an end as far as I can see. Um, but it's what you do with them and how they work and what people think and what the kind of, you know, the culture and, and, and all, all that sort of stuff that makes life interesting. Fantastic. Well, thank you again very much. Um, that was